<laughs> Guys, I want to get loud all of a sudden. I, I'm Do sorry, it. Sorry, I'm about I'm, I'm, I'm going to... <laughs> I knew it was coming. I'm sorry, guys. Can't hold I need back. to do that. It is. It is. You feel like Poseidon chucking that bugger down. <laughs> <laughs> chucking that bugger. Did Four you butt out that deer? I did not butt out that deer, but the next one I get, okay, I'm just getting its butt out. Is that little Stevie out here? No. Uh, <laughs> Drobop. <laughs> Bow drop. I'm sorry. <laughs> bop. Hello. Stay tuned. I'll be back after my seizure. <laughs> Every little chipmunk that was running around, everything's dead quiet, and I went mm-hmm. <laughs> like that. Just happened. Just happened. I saw what is in essence a nature gasm. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. This is Kyle. Welcome to another episode of the Sonic Campfire with the Rutten River Pursuits podcast. Tonight, I have with me... I'm Steve. I'm Will. Uncle Buck. This is Dave. I'm Catfish. And we also have a couple special guests from Bone Cold TV. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourselves, guys? How's it going, guys? This is uh, Sean Thompson with Bone Cold TV. And uh, Chad Faulkner, also with Bone Cold TV. Welcome, guys. Sean and Chad. Welcome. What's up, fellas? Thanks. Uh, Thanks for having us. Thanks for coming on. Glorious spring day. Usually this is the part of the podcast where I jump in and just ask a thousand questions. So can we start? <laughs> yep. Let's roll. <laughs> jump right in. <laughs> Take yes, it sir. away, catfish. <laughs> <laughs> no, we got we had the pleasure to meet uh uh Sean Chad and I wanna I just want to throw it out there too. I got to meet Bo, so he's not with us tonight, but Bo's also with them. And uh we were up at the Great American Outdoor Show. I don't know how many hundreds of times I got to walk past their booth. Um, you know, they're right <laughs> beside that. some of my waterfowl friends. And, uh, it, yeah, it gets to be like, oh, hey, guys. Hey, hey, guys. But at the end of the week, you're like, you know, saluting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's it just awkward. It's so, too much. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's the nature of the beast running around podcasting. But it was a great to meet you guys up there again. We ran into you last year. And... To ask you guys, like, I love to ask what's up for this year, and we're going to get into uh, Sean's epic adventure, because I, I just want to start with it. Chad, were, know, you, were, you, were you up there for that? For the Greenland trip? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah that's I right. There. Yeah, so that's right. That's right. <laughs> cool. So, yeah, we have to jump into this, because yeah. everybody's gearing up for turkeys, Yeah. but I think, you know... Well, why would we do that? What they went for Greenland for is, I mean, well, isn't it a subspecies of turkeys? I mean, it's a really big one. But, but no, what's cool about, like, you, you hear destination hunts, and nobody talks about Greenland. Well, that's when he told that's, me what he was going for. That's what's awesome about this. My eyes got really big, and I went, no way. Yeah. Like, that's... Yeah. You shut your mouth. Yeah. And my statistics on what this animal was was totally off, because yeah. I was about 3,000 pounds off when I told oh, him. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Aren't they like 5,000 pounds? <laughs> Ar- Arctic turkeys are that big? They are, actually. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> Subarctic. Subarctic. Oh, Sean, tell us about your trip. Yeah, uh, so Greenland is uh, was one of those, actually Chad's the one that set this trip up. It's one of those off the wall uh, trips that you guys are right. Not many people do it or have the uh, you know the courage to do it. It's a pretty mangy hunt. It's uh, it's cold up there. It's uh, you know it's forty degrees below zero. What? You're getting to the airport. Yeah, Maybe forty yeah. below. Yeah, man, forty <laughs> below zero. So and, and you know we're from the Buffalo, New York area, so we thought we were prepped for this cold weather, but. Uh, I don't think we anything can off. prep you for 40 below, bud. Oh, no. dude, it's, it, it, it cannot. You're it's ridiculous. Right. Better take it's a sweater. <laughs> or sweater. <laughs> it's sweater weather for New Yorkers, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. But, yeah, it was it was cold. It was uh, a lot of travel. In order to get to Greenland, you actually have to fly over to Europe. So we flew into, into Copenhagen in Denmark. And uh, so you fly right over Greenland, huh. literally, into Europe, and then fly back. Because there's only one flight a day coming in, so, so it's uh, so that first flight's like what twelve hours? Uh no, about nine. Okay. About nine hours from New York City. So nine, you know, and then another from... how many hours to Greenland? About five. Okay, five hours. That's a good day of travel. Yeah so, yeah, so we you know we land and all excited, and as soon as you step off that plane, it's uh, it's a it's a shocker, you know, because you're not. You're not prepared for that kind of cold, no matter where you're from. But you get dressed up, and they pick you up from the airport in a snowmobile. It's a uh, ATV with snowmobile treads on it, 
and you hop in the back of the, uh, I don't know what you would call it, Chad, uh, a wooden sled that they pull behind the, the ATV. Oh, wow. <laughs> the so, so is that how their wow. Ubers work? You know, just call. <laughs> I was going to say, that's a limo in Greenland. <laughs> yeah, I am I am fairly certain um, that uh, with, a, with a small population of that town, that Ubers don't exist. <laughs> yeah. dog, dog sled Ubers, that's about as much as you're getting up there. Oh, that's yep. awesome. <clears throat> so were you guys so actually you, prepared? I mean, did you have enough clothing? For the well, honestly, yeah. so we spent. Sorry, Sean, I don't mean to cut you off, but um, we we literally spent three and a half, four months um, got between myself and Sean and Brandon conference calling each other, saying, you know, oh, get on Amazon, I bought this, or look at this, and let's buy this, and you know, trying to mentally prepare ourselves for the cold and for uh, you know the the weather conditions, not just the temperatures, but the wind, um, and uh, just being in the elements and. We thought going into this that we were pretty well prepared. Um, and we spent a ton of money on, on new boots, Arctic boots, you know, to 60 below and alpaca socks and, and gloves that fit inside your gloves that fit inside mittens. And, and, uh, but like you said, it's, it's, uh, it's a different kind of cold. The minute you step off that airplane and you take one deep breath, any any moisture that's that's in your lungs, you can almost feel it freezes. You can almost feel it crystallizing really? inside yeah. your lungs. And oh man, that's crazy! It, it was a, it was at that moment where I, I remember I kind of looked at Sean Brandon as we were walking off the airplane, and I was going, uh, "Wow, like this is this is crazy. This what what are we doing?" <laughs> so so the um, air temperature is forty below. That's correct. And yes. then when the wind blows, it's minus ninety or something stupid. Just, yeah, 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 insane. Absolutely. Oh. We we were quite fortunate, and and I I'm kind of a numbers geek when it comes to this stuff. But I watched the wind and the weather for um, months leading up to it, and we actually hit it just right. I mean, there was a couple times um, during the days that um, you know leading up to it that I was looking that we might have you know 15 to 16 mile an hour gusts while we were there, but the wind was pretty low. Um, you know, five, six, seven miles an hour. And, which is good because uh, any of those gusts, they would just they cut right through all of your equipment. Oh, and it just my. made it so much colder. These people um, up there have to turn their heads and look at you because their eyeballs are frozen forward. I, I can't imagine. Uh, your, your, your eyeballs are frozen. Your eyelids are frozen. Your eyelashes. Are frozen. There's not a part on anybody up there that's not frozen. Yeah, it, it's an, it's and it's pure pain. Like if you yeah. just feel any part of it, your body, it's just pure pain. It, it, you know, and with that being said, it is pure pain. Um, any skin exposure would instantly, you know, you'd feel that coldness, but it would instantly start to burn. Um, I mean, we all came home with, with small parts of, of frostbite on us, you know, one spot or another. I had a nice little black patch on my cheek and one on my nose, um, wow. you know, and it just, and, and that's, oh, that was from um, just having your exposed skin. Uh, you know, we we ride around on, and like Sean had said, so they, you know, you leave the airport basically on sleds, um, and again, we weren't ready, so we're trying to prepare, and we're throwing on hats and gloves and ski masks and face masks, and it just you just cannot prepare yourself for for what you're getting yourself into at that point. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. That's incredible. So, and I, I got to see, uh, you know, I did text Sean at one point and, yep. and ask him what the, the, the weather was like and the temperature was like. That That's the first I heard, you know, it was like 40, minus 40, and, and then the, it did warm up to zero at, at times. Well, yeah, so, yeah, the one day, actually, one, one of the days um, we had almost full sun, um, and it did warm up. It, I don't think it ever broke zero, um, but it warmed up to, you know, maybe one or two below zero, and it was like a heat wave. I mean, we're talking, <laughs> yeah. this was like, you know, let's throw our swim, swimsuits on here and go outside, um, just because there is there is such a difference between minus 40 and minus 2. Um, you, you know, even minus 2 is so unbelievably cold, but the difference between minus 40 and minus 2 is, is it's, it's remarkable. 38. It's a remarkable difference. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Oh, yes. There he goes. Yeah. So, Phil's our math Very guru. Very good. So, yes. So nice. what took you to Greenland other than a plane? That- well, I will tell you. So anybody who is familiar with Bone Cold TV knows that we, we, we seek adventure. I mean, if, if you can legally get a tag for a species of animal, we are going to hunt it. And this has been... 
our lifestyle for our entire lives. I, I've known Sean for a very long time. We're, we're filming now for our sixth season of Bone Cold TV. Prior to that, we did a video series. Um, so what brought us to Greenland, you know, Muskox has been on my bucket list and oh. Sean's bucket list and Brandon's bucket list forever. Yeah. Um, not ever thinking that we would ever have the possibility of actually being able to hunt, let alone harvest a muskox. Um, but Bone Cold TV has been so unbelievably successful in, in our followers and our ratings and our numbers. And we're actually starting on a couple more networks um, for season uh, five, which will be um, starting to air in July. So it's just growing huge. And we had the opportunity from an outfitter who's based out of Europe um, who wants to start booking hunters from the United States reached out to me and said, hey, what's the possibility of you guys wanting to hunt muskox? And then from there, it was just, it, it was about a 13 month process to get this planned. Um, but at that point it was just a snowball. I, I remember I called Sean and I said, Hey, uh, what do you think about muskox in the next year? And it was like, do it, set it up, let's go. And, yeah. and then from there, it just, uh, kind of snowballed. And next thing you know, we're stepping off a plane and our lungs are freezing. Man, that is so next level though. I mean, I'm yeah. like, it's so amazing because I'm so used to be, like calling up Phil and be like, "Hey, you want to go fish for bluegills?" He's like, "Yeah, set it up, let's go." It's <laughs> uh, <laughs> over in Greenland, so next level. <laughs> yeah, well, we're we again, and you're probably going to hear me say this a million times, but we are so unbelievably blessed uh, to be able to do what we do, and and we've got a lot of big hunts coming up in the next year, and um, so yeah, muskox just it was our it was the next step. It was uh, you know the offer was there and the adventure was there and um our footage speaks for itself so it was kind of a uh it was kind of a you know we're we're doing it it's time let's go is there a special reason for this time of year to get over there for them is it is it something Uh, you know special with muskox rut yeah Yeah. that's is there is there a rut you know are they herded up better is it better plumage what's well so muskox do they Uh. Did you just say muskox <laughs> plumage? I got a backup. Did you say muskox plumage? I'm used to water. I, just, I'm I heard sorry. It, yeah. yeah, like their fur looks better. Their dreadlocks smell just a little less <laughs> yeah. this time of year. Well, I did. I did hear. I did hear muskox plumage. So we'll go with that. But, uh, <laughs> um, well, no. So in Greenland, you can actually start hunting muskox in Greenland in August. Um, now. I mean, we, where we were hunting, we were above the Arctic Circle, so their summers are very short. Um, but once their season starts, it is obviously a little warmer than it is now. Um, but again, looking at the bigger picture of the muskox, so ever since I was a little kid, I know maybe a handful of people who have ever hunted muskox, but the muskox is such a such an Arctic adventure, such a one of those hunts that you, you dream of hunting in the cold and in the snow and we wanted to experience the Arctic muskox hunt for all it was. So um, it just naturally kind of fell into uh, the time frame of uh, the end of March. And next thing you know, that's, that's when we planned it. We wanted to experience everything that these Inuit people do to harvest the muskox when they do it. And, you know, that's, that's, and, and I don't mean to sound redundant, but that is as much of this adventure just seeing how this is done, just seeing these people, seeing this culture, then then actually just going and killing a muskox. Um, so that's that was a lot of had a lot to do with why we went when we went. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, take us in, you know, take us to the hunt. You know, when you started, uh, you know, when uh, you're getting out there, you get to see them for the first time. You is know. this yeah? And this is is this a rifle hunt, an archery hunt? Uh, no, we we uh, we were bow hunting. Um, you know, obviously, like I said, you know, if we can get a tag for it, we're going to hunt it. So, uh, we, we bow hunt, we crossbow hunt, we rifle hunt. Uh, Koala bear. We, 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 we do. <laughs> Dude, you're not that far. Uh, I saw a, a guinea hunt. You would have died. Yeah. Abertro- Abertrosses. No, like these Albert- are no, but no, the, the guinea fowl. They did. They shot African guinea, guinea fowl in no, Africa. Uh, yeah. yeah. You, you would have died. Feathers everywhere. Poof. Yeah, we uh, we we we've, we've shot plumage. African guinea with our bows, and <laughs> yeah, we've awesome. shot them in Africa with our bows. So, wow, um, that's awesome. But, so, uh, but I and I did see the uh, the video that you posted about the the bows working in that temperature. You know, so that's that, impressive. That's impressive and very encouraging. That that was one of our big concerns, obviously. Um, and you know, we we hunt with elite archery work. 
we absolutely love our elite bows. Um, the outdoor group is an amazing company and uh, we had long conversations with them prior to the sense and filled them in on the conditions and the situations. Um, and they assured us that everything would work properly. And we were very, very impressed with, with the gear. Um, do you have, it, it, it stood up. Do you have to prep like practicing shooting your bow with all that gear on? Because that seems like thick gear. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, we, uh, you know, days prior, I would send pictures of Sean. He'd send pictures to me and, and Brandon and vice versa of us standing in our yards, you know, with 14 coats on trying to dry our bows. Um, just because you knew that at that moment we would be all geared up. Um, so yeah, we definitely had to, uh, we definitely had to, to, to prep, um, to be able to shoot, shoot with everything. It was, it was quite the, uh, it was quite the process to get ready for this trip. Guys, it's killing me. Did you have the bow mitt on? hundred percent. Amen. Absolutely. The, the, the bow mitt was 100% a life saver. Um, we had that thing strapped to our bows because as you know, some of the situations that occurred were, you know, it was all spot and stalk. So it was all on foot. Um, and we'd get ourselves in a situation where it was as fast as I could get the cameras out. Um, you know, where you got to take your top two layers of gloves off um, and reach in there and hold on to that cold metal bow when it's minus 40. And that bow mitt was, oh, that was probably the, one of the greatest inventions we could have had on that trip. That yeah, nice. that, that makes sense. We, we love Randy and the, the guys over at Better the Hunt. And, uh, you know, yeah, I can see that <laughs> you, that's a must take. Of all on, places, yeah. You, yeah. you got to take that to that, Greenland. That's an easy one there. Huh? Well, and you guys touched on something uh, too interesting, the, the cameras. How, how was... Uh, how much of batteries? A, yeah, how much of a hassle was that dealing with those temperatures and the camera gear? The camera situation was uh, probably the most prepped uh, part of the whole trip, believe it or not. Because so, as you know, when you bring something inside and outside, builds condensation. So the cameras, we actually had to leave in the colder elements. So you you actually leave your camera in a bag outside even when we go to bed at night. Okay. But the batteries, but the batteries had to stay warm the whole time. So we actually carried a a, a pouch around that had what 15 hand warmers in it and had all the batteries and and the phones in it for pictures so um it was it was it was a challenge by the end of every day all the batteries were all drained and there's no in camp there's no electricity there's no running water so your uh your only chance of charge recharging these batteries was to bring you know some pre-charged charging ports so oh wow i think between between the the three of us, we had maybe nine charging ports, sixteen, seventeen batteries, two hundred hand warmers. So it was a it was a full time job keeping the cameras operational. All right, so yeah, it was it was so sorry not to cut you off, but it was so cold that you know you'd be in a situation where you'd want to bring your camera out to just film the landscape um, for two seconds. Uh, you might be on the edge of a cliff, and you'd bring out a you know a nine hour battery, and you'd film for six seven minutes, and then you would be instantly down to one bar. Um, so we had to be really, really careful with, with, uh, our battery life basically, because, you know, by, we had three, we, between the three of us, we were all hunting together. So, um, you know, by the end of the week, the three of us, hopefully killing three muskox with our bows, um, we didn't want to get to our last hunt and not have any battery left. Um, uh, you know, so it was, uh, it, that was Sean's right. That was one of the most difficult parts of the, of the whole thing was, was, was the batteries. The level of preparation you guys went through is astounding. Uh, I, I can honestly say one of the biggest blunders I ever made in life with preparation is when I left for Alaska in 1997, I took two rolls of 35 millimeter film with me thinking that that was totally <laughs> enough. Oh, wow. And after about 10 hours of being out in the tundra, I realized I'm out of film and I'm 90 miles from the nearest anything. So, yeah. Right. It's, it's amazing yes. what you have to th- pre like you could get a headache pre-thinking about what you have to do almost to the point where it gives you anxiety do we did we think of everything we had terrible anxiety i i you know i wish i could take you back through our text with the last couple days leading up to the trip and it was it would be a text at two o'clock in the morning where i'd send one to brandon and sean saying guys are you sure we got this or sean sending me one at two three a.m saying maybe i should jump on amazon and buy a couple more battery chargers you know it was just one of those things where you know, we didn't really know what we were getting ourselves into, but um, in order for us to 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 document this hunt, um, you know, we knew we had to we had to be prepared. Are we allowed to ask to run us through the hunt, or do we have to wait for it to come out? 
Uh, yeah. No, no. Uh, I, think, yeah, I think the best thing to do is instead of running through all three is, is going right to yours, uh, if you don't mind. But skipping to the last day, we had all killed our muskox already. And uh, so in the morning, you get up, you get dressed, you have a little bit of breakfast. The sun's already up. And uh, again, the, the there's no running water. There's no electricity. So you got all, everybody in this cabin just all crunched together with this oil heat because you can't run generators because they seize up in the cold. And the bathroom was an outhouse about 30 yards from the house. No so way. It was. <laughs> oh, yes. It was. <laughs> That's and, not uh, a problem if you have to go. I guess not. <laughs> That's still so, a problem. Your bladder would just freeze oh, man, by the time yeah. you got there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, so the, the, Inuits, the Inuits, one of the biggest pieces of advice he gave us when we first got there is he said, I'm going to tell you guys the secret to going to the bathroom in Greenland. And as we're all on the edge of the sea waiting for this miraculous way to stay warm while we're going to this outhouse, he said, do it quick. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was his advice. So, yeah, you get prepped in the morning, you get dressed, and you you hop on the snowmobiles and you you drive around for, you know, hour, two hours, and you stop and you glass, and you glass all these mountains until you find a herd of muskox up on the mountain. And uh, a lot of the hunts that we've seen on TV, it's a lot of flat plains where these muskox, you just see them for miles away. And it, it was not that way. You know, you'd have to really work to find these things, and they're hidden up in the mountains. And you think, because of the snow, they stand out, but they look just like all the other rocks on the mountains. So, I mean, it really took a good set of binos to... Uh, to pick these things out first of all how how high up are they i'm not familiar with the terrain at all in, in greenland yeah, that's what mountains. i was just gonna ask tv good question set the picture for so, us yeah so greenland is it's not anything like you ever would think um you know i we did a lot of research leading into this and i watched a lot of hunts and talked to a lot of people about greenland um, but again 99 percent of the muskox hunts that are conducted um, are conducted in none of its and, you know, up uh, north in Canada where it's really flat and you're basically just hunting muskox as you would uh, like a bison out west where you're spotting and stock, you're spotting them from five miles away and you plan your, your, your stock. Where Greenland is, so we're on the edge of the glacier, the glacier that's been there since the Ice Age. Um, we actually hunted basically almost to the edge of the glacier. And I mean, we're talking, you know, this is, this ice has been there since the mammoths and it's just amazing to experience that. So, um, but it's nothing but rocks. There's no, there's no trees. Um, you know, you find the little vegetations in the flat valleys and stuff like that, but it's, it's so barren and it's just giant mountains, giant rocks and snow and ice. And that is it. Um, they're it's, pretty it's amazing really, animals to live in that element. Yeah, to adapt. It's it, it's mind blowing. Mind what, blowing. What are they eating? Like what? That, it's kind of. I mean, they're not just eating snowballs. Like, but it, <laughs> no. So, like, I, I, I'll, 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 I'll fill a second question to that. Like but, hostess. Yeah. <laughs> or, <laughs> when when you'd get up into some of the valleys in between these mountains. Um, you know, where the flats would be, you would find some vegetation, but all it really was was just, uh, you know, like a, like a, like a, a, and everything was covered with snow. So you could see where they would, they'd be working and they'd dig, um, and they would eat the little grasses out from underneath the snow. Um, but really, that's it. Um, there is nothing, there's nothing there for them. Um, but they've adapted and that's what they live off. And, you know, to them, that's, that's paradise. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Me too. It is amazing considering <laughs> how big they are. Yeah. I mean, it, well, how big are they? Well, this is funny because at the Great American Outdoor Show, I told Sean, I'm like, wow, dude, aren't they like, you're going to go kill a 2,000 pound buffalo pretty much. Like, I, I like, aren't they like 3,000 pounds? And then I, I've, I found out they, they were, they're huge, but they ain't quite that big. No, they're, they're probably range from, you know, six to 800 pounds, I would say. Man, boy, that one in the picture looked two thousand pounds. Yeah, yeah that's, easy. That's why I thought pounds. it is it the hair. I don't know. It is the hair. They make uh, they, it makes they have, big. They I think have, it's the plumage. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is definitely the plumage. They have hair. Uh, I mean, once once you have one down and you you go to you put your hand on it, you you can sink your arm all the way up to your to your elbow easy in just hair. Um, uh. It, they are unbelievable, which, again, which made it very interesting with picking our shots because 
um, you know, their bodies are actually quite a bit smaller than what they look when they're standing there at 30 yards in front of you. So um, it was really uh, another thing that we really prepped for was, was, uh, you know, studying their body shape and their vitals and where their shoulder blades go and, and just really making sure that uh, our equipment was going to do the trick. How well did the broadheads do shooting through a giant mat of hair like that? Did they, did they uh, actually cut through the hair? Did they open up going through? Oh, yeah. No, we, we all used uh, fixed blade broadheads. Uh, gives you a little bit better penetration than, you know, an expandable trying to open up when it hits all that hair. And like Chad said, you, depending on where you hit it, I mean, you got a good on the sides of their body. You're going through, you know, five to six inches of hair before you even get to skin. So it's a, uh, you, you really got to use a fixed blade, but we had good penetration on them. We had, uh, I think three of us, I think all three of us, actually, the arrow actually completely passed through on both sides. Wow. Good, um, good, good. Yeah. So, yeah. Let's get back to your hunt a little bit, if we could. So you're you're at the at the bottom of this mountain, and you're glassing up, trying to find these things that look like moving rocks. Then yeah, yeah, the, actually call them musk rocks. Musk rocks. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're yes. Checking out the musk. Then what that, happens after that? That was the name of my high school band. The musk rocks. The musk rocks. <laughs> <laughs> that was also Sean's nickname in high school, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> musk rocks. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, you just uh, so you're driving. Mostly, you're staying in the in the bottoms, and you're driving these snowmobiles, and you're bouncing around on these sleds. And uh, I'll tell you, at the end of the day, you're just you're so sore from keep trying to keep your muscles clenched because you're so cold, and at the same time, you're bouncing around on this wooden sled like oh, you're I just bet. getting beat up like a wooden roller coaster. So uh, you're driving on the actually driving on there's a a creek or a river that runs through these mountains. So you're driving on the flats on the bottom, but as you know, the ice is, is rocky and bumpy and whatnot. But so once you do spot a group, you know, you're checking your wind and you're pretty much putting a game plan together to drive the, the snowmobile around the other side of the mountain or get to the best spot where you can stalk up the mountain and, and get into bow range. So how's their vision? Uh, the vision's good. And what muskox do. Um, so they're, they're a herd animal. And uh, just like a bison or a buffalo would do, when they see you or become threatened or they think there's a predator around, they will all get into a big circle. Usually all the females and the young ones will get into the middle of the circle and they'll form a, a big circle to, to protect themselves. You know, it's a, a group effort to keep themselves safe. We, but, t- uh, we totally do that at Rutten River around Stevie. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking think that's, we, where, <laughs> that's where I'd be. <clears throat> I think we yeah, did that every time. We, we that's did believable. That yeah. <laughs> Are you seeing us at the outdoor show? Yeah. Yeah, we did that at the booth every time you guys walked by. We'd get in a herd. <laughs> <laughs> Here they come again. In the middle. Uh, so, so that's a major problem, though, with trying to only harvest one. You know, and being make an ethical shot if they're gonna group, bulk, group you know, up, group up like that. Mm-hmm. It, was that was oh, that a challenge? Yeah. Absolutely, it was. Um, you know, so we were far, we were so far north that yes, their eyesight is is really good. But a lot of the muskox we were hunting have never been hunted before. They've never seen humans before, so mm-hmm. they are used to. Uh, the, you know, a lot of them, uh, some of them would 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 circle up and kind of let you get somewhat close before they, you know, realize that we were dangerous and then they'd run, but other ones would see you coming from 400 yards and then they're just, they're long gone. So it really just depended on finding the right situation and the right animal where we could stock, you know, in the mountains. And, and there was a, you know, every situation was different. You know, we'd, we'd spot muskox from the bottom and it would make a game plan. And sometimes it was four or five hours of stalking to, um, to, to not even get within a hundred yards. And then other times it was four or five hours of stalking to have such a close call that it was just so much fun, obviously, but yeah. um, just, just, just every animal is different. Now, this might be a tough question for some of the listeners to comprehend, but there are some of the listeners that will totally get this answer. However, saying that it's probably going to be hard for you to describe it. When you take on such an epic adventure like this with all the planning, planning, preparation, dealing with the cold, spot and stalk, riding on the road, you know, the wooden roller coaster. When you actually get an animal on the ground and walk up and feel that sense of accomplishment, what actually goes through your head? That's got to, I mean, like your first deer, like, is it more because it's so harder, like so much harder hunt? 
I wouldn't, I honestly, I wouldn't say it's any, any more than when I shot my first whitetail. Um, but it is, but it's, it's the same feeling, but it's different. It's, it's an undescribable feeling. Um, you know, I've, like I said, I've, I've wanted to hunt a muskox since I was a little kid. Um, I've had this hunting bug forever and, and, uh, the, and it was probably even more for me because I spent pretty much the entire trip behind the camera. You know, I filmed Brandon shoot his, I filmed Sean's at a second angle shooting his, um, and we actually had a couple other guys that we took with us in camp and I filmed that other guy shoot, shoot his bull. And, uh, so I was the last one going into the last day of the hunt with the only one in camp, not having a muskox. So, um, you know, that, that, that final stock, um, you know, I finally, once I did have it on the ground, you know, it was just one of those surreal moments where, you know, I didn't, I just wanted to sit there with Brandon and, you know, with our Inuit guides and just look at the fact that we're sitting in Greenland, we're sitting in the middle of these mountains in the Arctic circle, pushed up against the glacier that's there from the ice age and, and just, and just take it all in. And, and that, that to me was, was, it's an undescribable event in my life that, yeah. that, that I can't even, I can't even explain. Real quick, uh, one of the things that popped in my head is when you have the animal down, like you, you got the animal down, and do the other muskox protect it at all in a circle, or do they just move on? Uh, no, so you know, um, I've hunted actually, I've hunted buffalo with some of the, uh, the Native American tribes out last out in Montana, and uh, you know, we've we've taken buffalo, and when they do go down, the other ones will try to protect the one that's down. But to every single one of our musk, <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> Um, Little but every single one, every single one of our muskox, um, when they went down, uh, the other ones would, would instantly leave it. I mean, he, they'd go down and the other ones were just gone. Like they, at that point they realized that there was danger and they were just, they were just getting as far away as possible. Do, I, I just, go ahead, Phil. I was going to say, do they, do they have an odor to them? Like, oh, it, they got a stink. Like a musky smell? Yeah. Like, not like a musky. Well, <laughs> Well, they, they do. And, you know, and originally that is how that, that yes, that is how they, uh, <laughs> uh, so originally that is how they got their name. Uh, muskox was from their mosquito. Now, obviously, um, just like a white tailed deer, uh, when a muskox is rutting, they emit a way muskier odor than any other time. Um, and we weren't hunting them in the rut. So they did have an odor to them, but I didn't find it personally to be anything that was um, exceptionally, you know, musky. Um, they were very clean animals. Um, and, uh, I, I, and I think, think the fact because it's so cold up there, nothing, nothing lives up there. I mean, there's no parasites, there's really no bugs, there's no ticks, nothing like that. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, they do have somewhat of a smell to them, and and you know, obviously during the rut, it is more of a musky odor than than when we were there. But it wasn't anything. It wasn't anything bad at all. On to the next sense for a question: How do they taste? <laughs> so, while we were there. Um, that is what you eat is muskox. Um, you know, so on Greenland, it's not like you just go buy a steak. If you're eating anything for dinner, for lunch, you are eating muskox. And, you know, the Inuits, uh, I, they cook the way that I like, honestly, you know, we go, we, so we travel and hunt all over the world and we've been very fortunate to do so. And, and we've, and Sean will eat anything. You throw anything on his plate and that kid's eating it before he even knows what it is. So I'm more of a, I'm more of a picky eater. So, um, the muskox steaks, they cook it in a frying pan, um, little salt, little pepper, and that's how you eat it. it which to me was fantastic. Um, way better than, than some of these other places where they're trying to make everything so fancy that you don't even know what the heck you're eating. Butter, um, syrup, but, hot sauce. Uh, Mix it up. <laughs> see? Yeah, see, yeah. now you're talking. <laughs> Did the uh, Inuit have, like, a special delicacy of the animal? Like they were like, oh, that's the good part. You know, like, we have to, you know, like a... Like the giblets or the tenderloin or... The tongue. I, yes, lizard. yes. The Inuit's favorite part is the giblets. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! They may call it, call it something else, but where I'm from, you know, giblets da, da, Gibble <laughs> shall not, <laughs> shall not <laughs> giblets. I, I guess. Are you talking in, about the Rocky Mountain oysters or what? Greenland well. meatball sandwiches. What are we talking about? <laughs> 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 it had to go there. Although, oh, hey, man. I could be totally wrong. It might be the thing, man. I mean, it, 
I don't know. Uh, did they let you in on any delicacies, guys? We we did not eat muskox giblets. <laughs> Glad we got that one answered. I'm shocked. Uh, check that one off your bucket list. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Will you guys promise me the next time you go, will you try the giblets? <laughs> I think you should take Phil with you. I would take Phil with you and make him eat the giblets after that. After he put you through this yeah. question. I'm afraid I wouldn't even make it out of the airport. They'd like, be stuck no. on the plane for no, a week. Yeah. No, 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 no. Too it, cold. It stings. It so, stings. Real quick, back because I got to go through a full hunt. How do you guys then? Is it is it the snow machines that you use to get the animal out of the out of the wilderness? Yeah, well, Chad again bouncing back to Chad's hunt. So we got we got on the last day on Chad's muskox. I got I'm running camera over Chad's shoulder and Brandon's behind us filming the whole you know bird's eye view of everything. So as you guys said, you know, you get them in the herd and it's tough to single one out. But the biggest bull that we got on, there was four, there was four of them in a, in a group in this, in this particular case. And uh, the back left one was blocked by another one. So we, we got up on them and they knew we were in the areas, but they were, you know, button heads. And when they, when they feel threatened, the males will all smash, smash their horns together and show dominance and strength and whatnot. So we had to kind of sit back a little bit, let them calm down. When they did calm down, the one in front moved out of the way. Chad drew back, shot him perfect. Um, and now at this point, we're on top of a mountain. So they start running along this edge of this cliff. They run about 30 yards and they stopped. Chad's knocking another arrow up and we're filming and trying to see which one it was, contemplating whether he should put another arrow in it. And and it started to go down. Well, it, it hit all four of its knees and in its last ditch effort, Gave it another thrust, and he went down the mountain. And uh, when I say down the mountain, I'm talking a steep, you, a human could not even get down to him kind of mountain. Right, like so like got, doll sheep and billy goats do, right? <laughs> like billy goat, yes, yes. Yeah. So he got down about 150 yards down the hill, and he got caught up in some brush. Well, the three of us ended up making our way down to this thing and thinking, let's try to cut this up. And I mean, this is an hour ordeal getting to it. And then an hour ordeal trying to figure out what do we do from here? It's, you know, it's not an animal you could throw on your shoulder and bring back up the mountain. So in order for us to turn this thing, cape it out and get all the meat off it and hike it back out was, it was impossible because one wrong move on this mountain, and, and, you know, our, our lives are in jeopardy. And then you're yeah. going, you're going down the mountain. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, we did a vote, and the vote was to push it the rest of the way down the mountain. And uh, it was probably, I, I don't know exactly, but I'm guessing another 800 to 1,000 yards down. As we pushed it, this 700-pound monster is just barreling down head oh, over man. back end. And, and we got it on video, and it's the sound... And, and, you know, Chad's face watching, hoping that the horns don't break off. And uh, just it, it's just amazing to watch this animal tumble down the mountain. But it turned out it was fine. Um, nice and tenderized. Tenderized, and, uh, I was going to say, yeah. yeah. But they ended up, so, yeah, they do drive the uh, the snow machines up to where the animal dies most of the time. If you can get to it better, you're quartering it out and getting the pieces down to the bottom so you can get to the snowmobiles. But, uh yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh, we, Sean, me and, so after we killed Sean's, uh, Sean and I, uh, skinned his pretty much right, kind of where it laid right on the frozen lake. And, uh, we took basically got his almost out completely skinned and, and quartered up just because of where it laid. But fortunately for mine, um, as it rolled down this giant mountain, you know, uh, it was the craziest thing I've ever seen. And, and, you know, I was elated that I harvested my muskox, but at the same time, I was just petrified that I wasn't going to have much of a muskox when it got to the bottom. Um, but when it did get to the bottom, we were able to drive the snowmobiles right to it. So we were actually were able to take mine out completely whole all the way back to camp, which was kind of nice. Awesome. Now the Inuits, do the Inuits get to partake in the meat that you don't bring home? Oh yeah, absolutely. So Greenland, and this is, this is what's so cool about doing these trips is we really get to learn so much about the culture is, um, so there's not, there's, there's, you don't have cattle farms in Greenland. So, um, 
not everybody is allowed to hunt. There's only certain people on the entire continent of Greenland who are designated hunters by the government. So what they get to do is they get to partake in what is called a meat hunt. So any of the meat that's left from, you know, the hunters that come over to, uh, you know, to hunt as, as tourists, such as ourselves, um, gets taken back to the town. Um, and they partake in a meat hunt a couple times a year where they'll go out and shoot um, you know, a bunch of the old cows and, and stuff to get, cause there's, don't get me wrong. There is a lot of muskox. Um, these muskox flourish in this, which is just mind blowing, but, um, um, and they'll go and they'll shoot, you know, 25, 30 animals. And then they take it back to the town and then each family, you know, they'll, they'll, okay, this family has two or three kids. So here you guys get three muskox for the winter. Um, you know, this family has one kid. So here you get a muskox for the winter. Um, so it's kind of a, it's a really unique situation and that's what they call the meat hunt. And, uh, that is how a lot of these people survive and how they eat throughout the year. And that's great. And, um, mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it's pretty fascinating. So you, you mentioned that you were, you guys were filming a lot of this, well, the, the entire trip, right? You know what oh, I yeah. would do? You yeah. know what I would do real quick? If What's I was that? Sean, I would, after Chad filmed all week. I would wait till Chad went to draw his bow and tell Chad all the batteries are dead. <laughs> <laughs> on the last day. On the last, I'd be like, dude, all the batteries are dead. <laughs> are we on a, a hot hands? The batteries are dead. <laughs> uh, oh, I'm sorry, I can, Stevie. I can go honestly ahead. tell you. I can honestly tell you that um, should between myself, not just the anticipation for myself, but it was there. Sean and Brandon were feeling it too. Um, trust yeah. me, even though they had muskox on the ground, they they felt my uh, my anticipation of trying to make this happen. So oh, yeah. um, it was just as did my bull. Honestly, is just as much of those guys as it is mine. I mean, they were they did the stock with me. They were there. All I did honestly was 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 hit the release on my bow. Everything else was was uh was all of us so you know one of the fun parts about flying somewhere to do something like when we went to florida one of my favorite parts is like the anticipation of going there kind of makes the trip go quicker and coming yeah. home always takes longer but yeah. when you film things like when we did our peacock bass fishing in florida sitting on the plane watching like going over video and pictures and remembering everything it's not your like your typical vacation trip i mean it I, I still I, I, do that. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's it makes the trip go a little quicker for me. You oh, guys had absolutely. a lot of time to travel back. We do. Um, you know, we do a lot of traveling and you know, we bring every time we go, we again we we try to be prepared, so we'll bring extra external hard drives. So we are backing everything up. Um I've got my laptop, Sean has his laptop. Um, we are constantly, you know, cause we might be running 10 GoPros, three main cameras, you know, backup cameras. So everything gets put in a folder labeled. Um, it's just a matter of, and then at that point, you know, I mean, we're talking uh, a trip of a lifetime, so I don't want just this on my laptop. So it's on my laptop yeah. and it goes on my external hard drive then it goes on to Sean's external hard drive. So we make sure everything is, everything is solidly backed up. And that does take a lot of time, which is nice because it does take a lot of the pressure off the the traveling where we're able to um, sit back and then be like, Oh, let's watch this kill shot again. It's like, ah, yes, that happened. Yeah. <laughs> kind of deal. So absolutely. I yeah. don't want to make, I don't want to do like a 360 here, but I just want to tell everybody that I love learning from guys that are hardcore because they love it. And I love learning from guys that, you know, have been there and done that. And they can tell you, you know, why this bass is sitting on this bed because they've been there and they know the time of year, why this muskox is going to do this in a circle. And the reason being from that is, you know, when I come talk to you guys at the Great American Outdoor Show every year, you guys just, you know, don't hunt and fish. From your experiences and being out there, you guys offer some amazing products from Antler Ice. And I want to bring this up because I don't know that if everybody out there knows about Antler Ice, but, you know, Sean and Chad, can you explain to everybody, like, what this product is? Because you guys have put a ton of a ton of research and effort into this and I don't want anybody to miss out on it. Yeah, absolutely. So antler ice is a, um, okay. So when, when deer hunt, antler ice was derived from, it started with a, a deer urine, a deer attractant, uh, concept, but let me, I mean, when you guys, when you guys go deer hunting and you go into the store and you're buying a bottle of deer urine to take out in the woods with you, I mean, you, you really, you just don't know what's in that bottle. Is it real? Is it a preservative? Is it a synthetic? Um, and they all smell different. So 
uh, a bodily fluid. Deer urine is a bodily fluid, just like anything else. You know, if you guys cut your finger off or you bled in a cup and or you urinate in a cup, that whatever's in that is going to rot. You know, it's a bodily. You know, you go out in the woods and you see a dead deer laying there. They're not, you know, months later they're rotting. And that's just what deer urine does. So we took the concept of taking the deer urine as soon as it left the body and we froze it immediately. So deer urine will rot in three days of being at room temperature. Wow. And the only way to stop that from happening is you're going to freeze it or you're going to pack it full of preservatives, which changes the smell completely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, that's what deer antler ice is. Antler ice is a, is a fresh frozen deer urine product that uh, is collected and, and frozen, and that's how consumers buy it. They keep it frozen until they're ready to take it out hunting. Okay. And um, so for guys that are looking to use it, um, is – you know, once you thaw it out or take it out of the freezer, is is it refreezable? I'm assuming it is. Yeah, you can you can refreeze antler ice as many times as you want to, as long as the total time that that li- you can't let the liquid exceed 72 hours of being liquid. Okay. Now refreeze. Now refreezing it doesn't reset that. So you know, if you took it out for you know one whole day and then refroze it, when you can't get back out, you only got two days left on it. Okay. And uh, how long have you guys been producing antler ice? Uh, This is, uh, we're going into our sixth season of using antler ice. Awesome. And then are you guys looking at, you know, expanding your product line and anything new coming out on the market that you, uh, you guys are pursuing? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it is always expanding. We've started off small, you know, we, we started antler ice on a, a very small budget. In fact, you know, put about 800 bucks into it to start. It got one freezer up and going and um, it has, it has bounded from there, but you know, we're not a big money company where we're able to grow it overnight. Um, it has caught on Dick sporting goods field and stream carries it. Um, we're heavy in nice. the Northeast. We're not, yeah, we're in the Midwest now all the way down to Florida. We'll be in Texas this year. And uh, so it is growing. Wow. It's a, uh, it's, it's, it's a very disruptive product in the industry. Um, you know, it's, it's not your typical deer urine. It's not, uh, you know, your traditional bottle of tinks that you go to the store and buy. It's, uh, it's very different. So anybody that hasn't used that, I encourage you to at least get your hands on a bottle and smell the difference. You know, when you, you shoot a deer and you take the bladder out and you empty that bladder, which is the urine into container and smell that urine, that urine smells nothing like you're buying in the store. People think that deer urine stinks like something rotten, but in fact, it does not. So, um, and all antler ice is, is 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 fresh urine that's frozen quick. There's no special ingredient. It's just it's just a quality. That's high it. End fresh. That's all that's there it. is to it. That's it, it, man. You guys kind of quickly brushed over the the concept of you you mentioned setting up a freezer and getting it out. And then you followed it up by saying it's just different than anything else. And that's one of the unique things that you, you guys do is your product comes in that freezer. Correct. correct yeah, me you, if can't, I'm wrong. you can't, you can't miss them. They're yeah. really cool. They just, the, you know, you it's got like the, getting your thing of worms. You got to open up the, the, the door. You but, know? And then at the end of the season, you come back and collect those freezers back up. Correct. We do. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it does, even as a frozen product, we put a three-year life on it. So any product that reaches that three-year part, we do discard. And then, uh, so when, when we redrop the freezers off in the fall, you know, the customers, the stores are all getting fresh product, brand new clean freezer, you know, uh, this way we can ensure everything stays, stays dated and whatnot. This way we can keep track of quality control. Your, your, your product is always looking good when you deliver it. It just doesn't get beat up at the store. That's impressive guys. I, I just, I wanted to highlight that a little bit. I got to ask cause nobody else will, where are you getting all this deer urine? <laughs> <laughs> Chad, it's actually Chad's kids. were. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> fresh diapers they're very quick uh, yeah, no. <laughs> just, uh, i wish them. i wish it was that easy <laughs> you drink a lot of water yeah yeah no we we have a we have a deer farm that we we use here locally um and we collect at the right times of year you know we collect our dough in heat when the does are in heat we don't a lot of companies will force their does into heat with injections or shots and whatnot and uh, we don't do that keep it all natural uh, they eat natural foods, and you know they don't 
we're not feeding pellets or anything like that that's going to change or alter any of the urine. So it's uh, so your antler come, ice is organic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, I've never heard of it spoken that way, but yeah, it's legit organic. <laughs> there can't be a, like, a better substitute for deer urine than actual deer urine, right? No GMOs, baby. No. Like, that's, no. that's it. There's not. There's not. In, uh, the ingredients you know, to say yeah. deer to, urine. <laughs> a lot of companies have gone to the synthetic. And, you know, even you guys, I challenge you, go, go to the store and open up or, you know, buy and open up three different uh deer urines and they're all going to smell different but they're all the same thing so why is that you know they're the, and the answer is yeah. they're using preservatives and some companies don't use preservatives don't get me wrong i i could name a few which i won't but oh you open their bottle and just just be prepared to fall backwards it's, it's, <laughs> it's brutal. Deer urine. And, and it's just like anything take your own urine put it in a jar for a month and then reopen it and and God bless you. Phil, oh, no. give that a shot. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no. We're going to video that. <laughs> Uncle Buck urine. A Gatorade bottle he found in the bed of his truck. <laughs> that, that, that wasn't lemon. Yeah, at, the, at the end of summer. That's, yeah. That's exactly it. So I keep it in the back of my that, truck. Yeah, you guys can't tell me that you haven't either, A, walked into a gas station bathroom that reeks oh, yeah. of ammonia, yeah. or B, that you haven't, you know, urinated in a tree stand in a Gatorade bottle, forgot it was there, and then opened it up to dump it out, and you're just gagging. So, I mean, yeah. it's a bottle of fluid, then it's going to rot, it's going to stink, and the only way to stop it is to freeze it, and that's the bottom line. No matter what anybody's going to tell you or try to persuade you into, that's the bottom line. There's no other way around it. Yeah. So. That's a really innovative way to 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 handle that that product. So, so good yes. on you. Yeah, so, so you guys have... Uh... Have have us covered on the deer attract and, and the things. Are you guys looking at getting into anything else? You know, like anything trapping related wise, any other different species or anything like that? Yeah, man. So we got uh, we have our elk urines coming out this year. So they're going to be out this fall. We'll have a, a bull elk and a cow elk and heat urine. Um, we do have all the predator urines coming out: coyote, red fox, uh, gray fox, raccoon. Um, all those will be coming out, but the big one that we just released last year was, uh, it's a, it's a non-urine product. It still is frozen to keep its freshness and it is called bear juice. Um, it is a bear attractant and we actually sent it out to about 15 outfitters last year. Uh, I got some to Chad. I got some to Brandon last year and we went on several bear hunts with it and um, I can send you guys the link. We did a, a six minute video on the bear juice, but yeah, please. We actually, it's it's seven different flavors. I call it flavors inside the bottle. <laughs> Did you taste those? <laughs> you, you you could drink it if you really wanted to. Yes, I wouldn't recommend it, wow. but you could. It's the Dr yeah. Pepper of bear attractants. Yeah, man, and it, it is all natural products. But I'll tell you what, in in channel testimony, test testify to this because he shot a couple bears using it. But bears are walking by chocolate and peanut butter and barrels of meat to come to over to this ghost wick to check it out. And in fact, a couple of us, a couple of guys shot the, uh, their bears this year using the bear juice. They're walking right past the barrel, right to the scent wick and they're shooting their bears on it. And it's uh, in fact changed a lot of outfitters will spend thousands and thousands of dollars on, uh, you know, baits during the year. We had 15 outfitters last year that we sent it to and four or five of these outfitters, have ordered several cases of the bear juice and they're switching to, instead of spending $6,000 a year on baits, they're buying the bear juice and buying a popcorn machine. So they'll put popcorn out and then hang the bear juice on the wicks above it. And it's just as effective. So wow. that's awesome. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a good product. Cool. Good for you guys. Yeah. I, I saw um, the Ontario bear hunt or at least one of them. I don't know if it's season three or, or, or four. That big boy. But, yeah, the, some, that one was a monster. Yeah, so, yeah, that was a big, big bear. We, yeah, we uh, we actually had unbelievable success uh, this past spring. So all uh, once our new episodes start airing in July, we uh, we did a lot of really, really, really good bear hunts. Um, and we've we shot bear up in Alberta. We shot them in Ontario. We shot them in New Brunswick. Um, 
We've got a, and, and really it was kind of our, uh, we, we spent a couple of weeks, uh, each of us taking that bear juice around and trying it. And, and the success we had was unbelievable. So you're going to, you know, you stay, stay with us and, and follow the show. You'll see some really, really good bear hunts coming up in the new season. Is the, is definitely the, will. Is the bear juice something that we could buy and then like travel to New Brunswick, Canada and just keep it frozen? Like keep absolutely just take it with you and keep it frozen then. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You can go right to antlerice.com, order it up. It gets shipped frozen right to your door. Um, keep it frozen. And then, yeah, when you go on your trip, just, uh, and when you get the shipment in the mail, it's actually wrapped in silver wrap. So you can keep it right in there, keep it in your freezer. And then when you pack your bags to go that day, just throw it in your bag and off you go. We're going to have to upgrade some coolers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So is there anything uh, on the horizon for Bone Cold TV? What's what's going to be new? Well, we are – so Bone Cold TV, we are growing um, – uh, It's our, our growth is amazing. Um, we, uh, we're, we're starting on a few new networks. Um, we're continuing on the networks that, that we have been just crushing. Um, I'll tell you, one of our big, one of the big things that we did in the last 12 months is we started on Wild TV up in Canada, and uh, we actually just just got a letter from Wild TV here last week uh, stating that we're in the top highest rated shows on the entire network, and oh, that nice. they're oh, awesome. unbelievably pleased, and and uh, you know looking forward to continuing us in their primetime lineups, and yeah, it's it's really it's really cool. So um, you know, and we're adding a few more networks on, and uh, just just continuing to grow. We've got some. We've got a couple big trips coming up. Um, we're actually we're we're off to well, we got some bear camps coming up here this spring. Obviously, turkey season, um, and then we're off to uh, New Zealand in July. Um, and then uh, we've got some some amazing mountain Canada hunts going on this fall, and we've got a lot of a lot of really good stuff. So you know, I mean, I'd love for people that that are listening to this to go over to the the Bone Cold TV Facebook page and the Antler Ice Facebook page and like them up and follow some of these adventures. Cause we'll have all sorts of cool little videos and pictures coming up of all these, all these new trips that we've got going on. And, and, uh, we've got a lot of, a lot of good stuff. It's going really, really well. Yeah, so. I've been following you guys on Instagram for a while and just, I mean, it's a great feed. It's you're always up to some new adventure. It's just bone cold TV on Instagram. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's great. It so is, that's yes. another, another thing to, to watch out for you guys on. Listen. Absolutely. Absolutely. We sure. appreciate it, man. We'd love to have you guys join us on one of these hunts, man. Well, you stop it. It's funny. Don't, don't you threat don't, us with a good yeah, time. Yeah, don't you tell <laughs> us with that <laughs> away. <laughs> you know, Listen, may, can, maybe it would. Do... It might be like season 37 or something, but hypothetically <laughs> speaking, would it, be, would it be unfathomable to think that we can hunt for giant flatheads off the kayaks? Is that too hard to film? Because I, is... I know a guy. I well, I, and I will tell you, and I know we've had this conversation, but um, come this summer, there is nothing I would love more to come down and then catch a giant flathead off a, off a kayak with you, my friend. Yeah, buddy. That sounds like a good time right there. That sounds like a fantastic time. We need, we need flathead. We need flathead at frozen juice. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> like, frozen like frozen fro- bluegill fro- juice. Like Shad frozen, juice. Frozen, frozen squid and bluegill <laughs> juice mixed together. Yep. Don't yeah, forget the buddy. liver. And- we could just hang the wick right off the kayak, I and they'll you, come in downstream. You guys are saying too much. I mean, we don't. We're really letting like, all of our we'll, secrets. Yeah. We're going to edit all this out. We're going to have to edit this, but you could call it. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> but I, yeah, no, that would be great. I mean, to have some kind of a collaboration, uh, you know, in the future. Please, you know, uh, you know, we'll be following you guys and uh, and and stick with us. That would be great just gonna say right back at you guys man you guys are a, a class act most of the time uh, so. <laughs> to say the least and, uh, so. we, we we enjoy seeing you guys at the show and laughing with you guys and we listen to your stuff and uh you know we we encourage everybody to listen to your guys stuff you guys are a funny group and intelligent group and you know to see hunters in the industry doing what you guys are doing and and not many people are doing that that's uh that's a cool gig man so anything you guys ever need from us we'll, we'll be there my man All right, thank you just shout yeah. What networks is Bone Cold TV on? Uh, so right now you can watch us on, um, if you're in Canada or Europe, you can watch us on Wild TV. Um, we are on Hunt Channel, we're on Gen 7 Outdoors. Uh, Carbon TV has been real big for us. Nice. Um, we are on uh, Camel Crusade. 
We are starting on the Outdoor Adventure Network um, in the next month. And then we've got two or three other contracts that I'm working on as we speak right now uh, to some upcoming more networks. And then we are also on um, locally because we have such a giant following here in Western New York. We're on um, My TV Buffalo, uh, My TV Rochester. We're on the Rochester Sports Network. Uh, we're on the Big Fox out of Corning Elmira. Um, and we've got probably another half a dozen or so that uh, we should be wrapping up here shortly. So, um, so to really, our it's New York listeners, <laughs> our New York listeners, if they haven't caught you on TV, they are missing out. Yeah, yeah. It, well, <laughs> yeah, it's almost impossible not to find us somewhere at this yeah, point. Yeah. That's How far fair. away are you guys from Montauk? Just throwing this out there. They're in, um, they're in Western what, New York, so oh, there they, yeah, yeah, I got you. yeah, we're quite a long ways. We're trying to make a day trip to Montauk, and uh, yeah, we want to go hang out with the Bone Cold guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's what, that might be a week a long trip. double date. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, man. yeah. We're uh, we're we're we are located. We're just kind of south of Buffalo, so we're up by the Great Lakes. I guess there I should go. have started that by saying hypothetically, if I don't know anything <laughs> about New York or where anything yeah. is. Yeah. All right. You do a great lake trip. Up here, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah we're, well, we're actually getting ready to uh, to start our, our channel cat fishing season here. So um, so that'll cool. be that'll be start. As a matter of fact, Sean, I think you're going tomorrow night, aren't you? I am going cat fishing tomorrow night. Oh. Yeah, Sean. Yeah. So you might you might catch me up there with you. You never know. I got a lot to go on here. Someone's got to do the work, but I might break away and do some fishing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll be in Soda's <laughs> Point here in another couple of weeks. Oh yeah. Nice. Excellent. So, yeah, we love that place. Um, guys, thank you so much. I you know, um so what's the best way to find you? Well, I know we talked about Instagram and we talked about all the, the T V networks. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But if you if you guys go to uh, BoneColdTV.com, um, you know, or and and or AntlerIce.com, um, you know, that'll uh, the AntlerIce.com will take you right to the to the business side, get you hooked up with uh, getting you uh, shipped, you know, some uh, frozen antler ice right to your door. Uh, BoneColdTV.com will get you. Uh, there's a you can watch all our past episodes on there. Uh, there is a listing of where you can find us at times and what networks all on that website. And uh, that, then from there, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, uh, all that, all that fun stuff. And we'll get you, you know, hopefully uh, you know, we got all sorts of contests going all the time. Uh, we've got a really good one right now. We're, we're doing some, some Turkey hunting contests. And so, yeah, you know, I encourage people to get on there and find it. And, and we give away stuff all the time, which is kind of fun and interactive and, and, uh, you know, we, we, we're always looking for people to get on there and, and talk to. Cool. Well, Uncle Buck normally yes, asks, like, what's your bucket list hunt? But on this episode, I'd like to say my, one of my, because I know you guys would be proficient knowing this. I, I want to throw a, a, a big shout out to one of my new friends, Nancy, and uh, a crocodile hunt would be on my bucket list you, in Africa. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think Nancy could uh, set that up? <laughs> I will tell you right now, if anybody in the listening area in the world wants to hunt anything in Africa, Nancy can hook you up. I shot a beautiful crocodile in Africa a few years ago. Oh. And uh, I will tell you that Nancy is by far the best person for anybody seeking an African adventure. And uh, again, um, I mean, we've we've hunted Africa numerous times with Nancy, and it's uh, it's unreal. So when you're ready, you let us know because we're going back. We'll, we'll be back with Nancy again in in a year or so. So we'll, maybe do, we'll we'll have you tag along. And how did I pronounce? How do I pronounce her outfitter? Because I I wanted to say hi to her because she was so kind and, and sweet. Yeah, we to got me to sit show. down with her, and she was a great podcast. She interview. was. How, what's her outfitter called again? So Nancy runs Avula Safaris. Avula, that's it. Yep, and uh, you know if you go to our page BoneColdTV.com, um, there's a link on there that can take you right to Avula Safari's page, and you can get in touch with Nancy right off our right off our page. Well, I appreciate you helping me, you know, throw that out there because she was so nice to us at the show, literally Not treated us we, like her own children. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's what she does. We will do anything for Nancy. Yeah, guys, this has been awesome, man. Thanks so much for talking with us, uh, and you guys have so much content. You're so busy that I'm sure that we could probably do future episodes and get all new, all new fun 
Yeah, yeah we talked about people. one hunt tonight. One hunt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 A treasure yeah, trove. For sure. Well, we yeah. we would uh, we would be more than more than willing and welcome to come back anytime you guys want. Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, boys, that's great. How can uh, how can they find us? You can find us at uh, ruttenriverpursuits.com. You can also find us at Rutten River Pursuits on Instagram. And uh, go look at Rutten River Pursuits podcast on YouTube. Did I get that correct, Deke? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep, yep. And, uh, you know, we're on, like, uh, iTunes, Stitcher, Google, Google Play, Play, and Cashbox. Cashbox. And uh, on some of those, iTunes, Castbox, I know for sure, please leave us a like and a review. We have a new thing for our second podcast uh, that goes with this. We do In the Current, which we're about to do next. And on that comment section, leave us a review. You can also throw us something for the hat. We have a hat where we have uh, different topic topics hat. in it. Yeah. So we'd love to hear a topic that you would like us to talk about, hunting or fishing or adventure-wise, whatever. And uh, you can do that in the comment section. So we appreciate it, guys. Thank you very much. And uh, it's been thanks a great show. Guys. Yeah, thanks yep. for coming on, guys. Thanks, Bone Cold. See you guys. Later. Yeah, thanks, guys. Peace. Get you some. Rig them weedless. Yeah, like yeah. That's, is there is there a rut? It, you know, are they herded up better? Is it better plumage? What's well, so oh, muskox do? Is awesome. they, uh, did you just say <laughs> muskox plumage? I got a backup. Did you say muskox plumage? I'm used to water I, I just, so sorry. It, yeah. yeah, like their fur looks better. Their dreadlocks <laughs> smell just a little less yeah. this time of year. <laughs> Did the uh, Inuit have like a special delicacy of the animal? Like they were like, oh, that's the good part. You know, like we have to, you know, like a. Like the giblets. Or the tenderloin. Or the tongue. I, yes, gizzard. yes. The Inuit's favorite part is the giblets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. When he came into camp, I have you one of the most is? beautiful caribou antler knives that is custom carved by him and oh, i wow. traded him a snickers bar what for a <laughs> caribou knife really oh, oh it's a hell of a trade it Man. was but to him i mean he got the better part of it to, you know to, to him he won yeah and to this day it's i have like, a one-of-a-kind caribou his candy knife. bar is long gone oh yeah <laughs> it's worth a snickers i don't, bar I don't know that uh I don't know that Chad would have made that trade. No, man. <laughs> I don't know. I might have cut. I might have cut that Snickers. <laughs> how, about a, how about a half? <laughs> After four.